So, I want to talk about patterns. Patterns that I notice, personally, uh, either in software or hardware or sometimes both. Uh, and the pattern I want to talk about today is there is often a thing inside of the thing. So let's take a concrete example. Let's say you want to buy a computer, but you don't want to buy like a ready-made pre-assembled computer. You want to buy computer parts because you hate yourself, but you love money. So you go out and you order um, a motherboard, a CPU, a case, some fans, storage, and this is this is a fantasy. There's no chip shortage. There's no cryptocurrencies. So you get an SSD and also a fancy modern graphics card. And so you assemble all the parts, boot off a USB stick and you install Windows. And then before you can play some games, you have to install the graphics card driver. So you go on the manufacturer's website and you look for the downloads. They're kind of hidden away. And then you download a 670 megabyte file that contains mostly things you do not want or need, but that the manufacturer really, really would like you to have as, as a gift. Then you launch the installer, then you click next and next and next and hold on, wait a minute, how are you doing that? Because you're installing the drivers for the graphics card, the graphics card that has an HDMI or DVI or VGA port that is physically connected to your monitor. And I know the monitor is the thing that displays the image, the pixels, but the graphics card is the thing that decides what the pixels should be. So how are you even seeing anything right now? It doesn't make... I don't... Well... Inside the graphics card, there is a simpler system. I'm not saying it's a separate chip, it's just a separate system that is simple enough and standardized enough so that Windows knows how to drive it without any third-party software. You still want the third-party driver. You still want to be able to do fancy modern graphics stuff, use real-time ray tracing, and you want to be able to do machine learning, maybe. Um, but you don't need all of that just for basic operation, just show me a screen. And so there is a thing inside the thing. There's the full graphics card and there's the basic interface that Windows knows how to speak. And inside your computer, there's also a simpler system that used to be the BIOS and now it's UEFI, which I hear is interesting. And it turns out that having those simpler systems inside your computer can actually unlock some pretty cool features. So for example, you can configure a computer to wake up from sleep whenever it receives a magic packet over the network. So that works because the simpler system inside your computer can talk to the network interface. And so when your computer goes to sleep, everything goes to sleep except for the network card, which just stays in some sort of low power state where it's still kind of listening for the magic packets and nothing else. And whenever it receives one, it lets a motherboard know, hey, please wake up the rest of the computer. We got work to do. Anyway, I hope you can see the pattern where at first we expose some very simple interface, simple enough that it should work all of the time. So for the computer, it's the BIOS or UEFI. For the graphics card, it's that standard interface that Windows can speak and the BIOS and the UEFI can speak. And we do the same thing in software. So let's go back to when you were trying to install the graphics driver for your graphics card you went on the manufacturer's website. And what happened then is that the browser makes a request to the server over plain text HTTP. It's just sending some words, English words, like get this path, HTTP 1.1, please, on TCP port 80. And the server will understand that request and reply with, please, let's not use HTTP, let's use HTTPS, uh, which is secure, and I would like to do. And then the client will automatically visit the HTTPS version of the site, unless you're a retro computer enthusiast and you're running Internet Explorer 4 or something, and it doesn't speak modern CLS. But if you have a regular modern day web browser, it'll just, okay, it'll just open a connection on TCP port 443 and start a CLS session and do a little handshake with the server, like, okay, now we can be secure and then it just works. 
and TLS is just the secure transport. We're still sending English words like get, path, HTTP, header on top of an encrypted layer that is secure unless someone messed something up or someone did some research or someone has a quantum computer and they broke all the cryptography of the past few decades. I, I don't know. But it doesn't even stop there. There's a thing inside the thing inside of TLS. TLS has a bunch of different versions. Too many versions, if you ask me. But most of the versions are getting retired, except for TLS 1.2 and TLS 1.3. And I think the way the upgrade was done is interesting. So whenever you invent a new protocol and you want to roll it out, you have to think about how to do it without breaking everything. Uh, you can't just make everything incompatible right away. First, you have to support the new thing, but also the old thing to give everyone time to upgrade to the new thing. And then maybe later at some point in time, if you're lucky, you can retire the old thing. And for example, with HTTP, we have HTTP 1, which is just English words, boring. Uh, and you have HTTP 2, which is binary and efficient and compresses headers and can multiplex requests over the same connection. And it's great. Uh, but they both work on top of TLS. And so when you do a TLS handshake, you tell the server, hey, we can we can talk HTTP 1. That's cool. I'm, I'm into that. But also we can try that new thing called HTTP 2, which is not that new because there's HTTP 3 coming out. And the server also has a list of languages, protocols it's willing to speak. And it kind of compares the clients list with its own list and goes like, actually, I can only talk HTTP 1 and let's just stick to that, please. Or it can go, hey, awesome. I also love HTTP 2, let's just do that, right? But when you're trying to release a new version of TLS, it's not as easy. So there was already versioning mechanisms for older versions of TLS so that the client and the server could agree to a common version to speak. And if you look at the differences between TLS 1.1 and TLS 1.2, there were some fields that were added in the first message sent from the client to the server, the client hello. But the rest of the handshake is different for TLS 1.3, different enough that it's not just adding new fields, it's a different set of messages that are exchanged back and forth. So what it could have done is just make a completely new incompatible protocol, right? Just make the initial client hello message look completely different. But then what if the server doesn't support it? Then the client has to wait for the server to reply back and say, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. What language are you speaking? And then the client has to try something older. So instead, what they did is when you want to start a TLS 1.3 session, you send a TLS 1.2 client hello. But there's a new extension in the initial message that says, here's the list of TLS versions I'm willing to speak. And in that list, there is TLS 1.3. And then one of two things happens. Either the server does support TLS 1.3 and then it continues with a TLS 1.3 handshake, or it doesn't and it just continues with TLS 1.2 handshake. And so it doesn't break. It uses the best possible version of the protocol that both peers support. And at this point, some of you might be wondering, so does that mean that we're gonna be stuck with TLS 1.2 forever? How are we ever going to be able to retire it? Well, if one day in the future we decide that TLS 1.2 is not secure enough, and as the operators of the website of the manufacturer of the graphics card that you can only get in this fantasy world that we're talking about, you don't want to support TLS 1.2 anymore, then you can just have the server refuse to establish a TLS connection if the client doesn't advertise support for TLS 1.3. And we can have it the other way around too. If the client initiates a TLS session with the server, uh, asking for TLS 1.3 and the server continues with the TLS 1.2 handshake, the client can just refuse to continue and just tell the user, hey, this server is not secure. I don't want to speak to it. And this kind of incremental change happens all the time in both hardware and software. It's that your CPU, for example, even a modern day CPU when it first starts up acts like a CPU from the 1980s. It's 16 bit, doesn't have any threads, there's only one core you can run code on. Uh, it doesn't have any caches. It doesn't have any RAM at all. And then it switches through different modes. It travels through decades and then finally arrives at the 64-bit mode where Windows 10 is happy to execute, for example. And what that means is you can take an operating system from the 1980s 
and run it on a modern CPU. Yes, because DOS, it don't care. All it knows is that there's an A drive, a C drive, and there's a PC it can be installed on, so that's what it's gonna do. And that also means that if you're trying to write a bootloader, you're gonna have to deal with all that historical baggage. And you're gonna have to write some 16-bit code and then 32-bit code and not have access to RAM or whatever. Fun. Just like if you write a TLS 4.7 implementation in the future, you're probably gonna have to deal with the TLS 1.2 client hello. And I just think it's interesting, you know, because sometimes we look at the complexity of some system and we think, ah, damn it. But if we look at it like a history lesson, if we dig into why it's that way, often there's a good reason. I'm pretty happy there's a thing before the computer boots up that can let me know if I messed up when I assembled parts. That's pretty cool. It's also pretty neat to be able to run operating systems that were written decades ago on a computer that I have today. It doesn't always make sense to have incremental change, but sometimes it does. And either way, it's fascinating to just learn why the systems that we use today are that way. And I think it makes it a bit less frustrating to interact with them. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked it, I guess like, comment and subscribe. I'd like to thank all my Patreon subscribers for supporting me through this second video I'm making. I hope it's not too bad. I wanted to do something different where we're not looking at some Rust code, but instead we're just thinking about computers, uh, which hopefully makes it a little more accessible. Thanks for watching. I'll see y'all next time.